Okay, my name is Jonas. I work at Blockstream and I'm going to talk about a little project of mine that I started for myself mostly, but uh, nowadays there seem to be a few people who find this useful for, some, for themselves. So they started contribu contributing to this open source uh, project. Now I talked a little bit to Bitcoiners yesterday and quite a few Bitcoiners seem to have a smart home. And I don't mean that, I don't know if they have like an Alexa or smart temperature sensors or whatever, but a few of them, including me, they have this, a Bitcoin node at home. And this is a really, really useful model, I think, because this allows you to verify the full chain. You don't have to send anyone your private information, including addresses. It's mostly 100% online. Uh, you can install more software than Bitcoin, for example, Lightning easily. Um, you can provide public infrastructure uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but this isn't the only use case. Uh, the other use case is for businesses who want secure nodes and there's actually one using this right now. Um, so how do we do this? In my life as an engineer, I've already set up way too many nodes. I'm really tired of this. So I thought there must be a more systematic way to do this. And then I came up with Nix Bitcoin. But first, the challenges that you have when you set up a node. You have to think, do you trust the binaries from some cache, be it your operating system or a GitHub release? Or do you build from source? And if so, where do you get the source? Do you always check the signatures? Do you isolate services, for example, by giving them different user accounts and use least privileges? Do you containerize these services? Do you minimize dependencies or do you install just everything? Do you use a hardened kernel? Is your setup reproducible such that if there is a compromise, you know exactly where it comes from and what was compromised? So the goal was to do that once and then for all and that never have to do the same thing again. So what Nix Bitcoin is, it's just a set of configuration text files depict, depicted on the left. And then you use the Nix tools to basically translate these configuration files into an actual deployment, a Bitcoin node you run at home or at a data center. So before you do a deployment, you need to ask yourself, where do you want to deploy it? You need a target. Uh, you will have most fun if you have at least four gigabytes of memory. Uh, CPU right now, it doesn't work on ARM or at least it's not tested for most modules. So you need an Intel, but it can be a relatively weak one and you need enough space depending on what you want to do. So C Lightning, for example, doesn't work really with pruning right now. Uh, so um, you need to uh, store the whole chain. As a tutorial for also deploying this whole thing on a virtual box, the readme uh, of this repository if you just want to try it out. You also need a machine to deploy from. This would be your personal laptop. And this also right now where the packages are built. So this needs to have the same architecture right now because it's not really tested for anything else. And then you clone the repository. So, and now happens uh, the thing where I said this is for hackers because this doesn't have a graphical user interface and I'm not interested in writing one because I'm lazy and I mostly do this for myself and the contributors also, they do it for themselves and we think configuration files are just fine. So you see the configuration file in the repository and there is a couple of fix me's. You go through them and you basically do whatever is set there. For example, you, some, if you install it on an XOS machine, you need to import a hardware configuration, but this is all exp explained once you install NixOS. Then you enable the Nix Bitcoin service. You probably also want to change your host name. You want to add some additional packages that you need, like HTOP or Termux, uh, whatever, uh, Tmux. And then you say, I want to enable the Sea Lightning service. I want to enable the Spark Wallet service, and so on. So there's a couple of modules right now. Right now. So for example, there's a Bitcoin D. This is always active. 
and it has what I call a reasonable default config because it's Tor only, so it doesn't expose to anyone that you're using Bitcoin in the first place. It has a ban list, so it bans some known spy nodes and other like just sensible defaults. Uh, there's C Lightning with a default config, which is also Tor only. It's not listening, so it's easy to do if you want to do that. But as a like normal user who's not routing, I guess you don't need this. So why would we activate it? There's also Spark Wallet, which allows you to uh, use your C Lightning node with your mobile wallet. I'm going to talk a little bit about this later. There's the recurring donations module, which I'm also going to mention later. And now with the latest Bitcoin Core release, you can use hardware wallets with Bitcoin Core. This works with most major hardware wallets. It's a little bit cumbersome right now, but it's still my favorite way to use hardware wallets. Um, you can run, you can just enable the liquid daemon, which allows you to use Blockstream's sidechain, send coins there, use it with confidential transactions, assets, whatever you want to do. Uh, there's also Nanopos, which is a point of sale system. Electris, which is a Rust implementation of the Electrum personal server. It's also usable with the Electrum mobile app. I don't use this, so I don't really know much about it, but the contributor uh, wrote this. There's an SSH hidden service, which allows you to uh, SSH into your system from anywhere. And there's a non root user operator, which has access to all of this, because since this all the services operate under their own user it would be very uh, laborious to always change your user and then try to change the user just for using Bitcoin and change it again for using Lightning and so on. Okay, so I anticipated this. Here's a little demo. I'm not sure if you can see it from the back. So I try to talk about it. So you go into the, um, the directory and you run Nix shell and this basically sets up your environment and what we are going to do is we first create the deployment it's called which takes a network file saying how this network looks like right here in this example it's just a virtual box uh, network which is called fresh deployment and we run fre fresh deploy we deploy on the fresh deployment uh, we uh, redirect the output to a file so this uh, uh, finishes very quickly now, usually it takes a little bit longer, so now the system is set up. Uh, then we SSH into our newly um, installed Nix Bitcoin node. It's really slow. Okay, so now we're in and now the first thing we do is we run node info and this gives you uh, general information about your node, for example, all the hidden services you have set up, your uh, node ID for Lightning, SSHD, Onion and so on. There's also a web index, we call this. This is just an engine X running there, giving you similar information for some people who you just give your uh, an HTTP um, server to and they can see, okay, there's the POS, the point of sale service. This is the node I can connect to and so on. So now we switched into the user operator and there we see that all the stuff is syncing right now. So there's Bitcoin desyncing, Lightning syncing, Liquid syncing. I think that's basically it. And Spark Wallet's also running. Okay. Um, okay. We've seen this. Just some basic information, mainly hidden services. Uh, okay. So. One thing that you can do with it is this, I can control my C Lightning node using a mobile app. And for that, you just need to enable the Spark Wallet software on the Nix Bitcoin machine in the configuration. You download the Android app, the Spark Wallet app. You use Orbot. This is a, uh, an app that allows you to use Tor. And then you configure it such that uh, it always tunnels requests from the Android app through Tor. You do that once, just for this app, and then this works. It sounds very janky and um, fragile, but actually it works really well for me. And I'm saying, um, so, so one thing is, how do you pair this with your Android wallet? So the thing is, you just look into the logs of Spark Wallet. This is what you see here, Journal CTL, Spark Wallet. And then you see a, a QR code that's usually a little bit smaller, so you just scan it 
and then you're basically connected if you have Orbot set up. Uh, and I'm saying you need to be a Bitcoin Austrian right now because you need to view Satoshi as a unit of account because um, the, ex uh, the, the um, translation into US dollar doesn't really work with our app right now. And this is an interesting bug because we've restricted the Spark Wallet service to only be able to get out of Nix Bitcoin through Tor. Now, what Spark Wallet does is just queries the Bitfinex API, but Bitfinex doesn't allow Tor requests, or it, at least you need to go through Cloudflare or whatever. So this doesn't work right now, unfortunately, but uh, the newest Spark Wallet release fixes this. It's not released uh, yet, unfortunately, but um, so Wasabi Wallet is nice enough to provide an API with current prices uh, that you can reach through Tor. Uh, then we have a module that's called Recurring Donations. So I think this is really an underdeveloped area in Bitcoin right now because there are many people doing great stuff in the Bitcoin ecosystem and many Bitcoiners with a lot of Bitcoin. But somehow these two don't meet. Now there are a few people building platforms for doing this donation stuff, but these are only servers. We also need clients. Uh, because you don't want to spend a huge amount or something every year, it would be much easier to just automatically send a small amount every week. And since we have access to the whole system, uh, we can do that very easily in Nix Bitcoin because we can install a cron job or in our case a system D timer. So the way you configure this, you just go into your configuration.nix, you say recurring donations enabled true and then you list whoever you want to send a donation to. So in this case, it's DJ Booth. We send 20,000 Satoshis uh, every week on a random uh, time on Monday. Uh, he's maintaining Telecoin and uh, Max Hillebrand and René for his, his book. Okay, so this so far was mostly what you need to know if you want to use Nix Bitcoin, but here we're at a hackathon, so this is some further information for design decisions in this thing and also what you need to know if you really want to dig deeper or if you encounter problems. So uh, the main idea when I started this was that there must be a more systematic approach to setting up servers than what we usually do, SSHing into a server and then change things there and then see if it works and so on. So what I wanted was, I wanted a file that specifies, or multiple files, the, multi, the, the whole system and this allows me to put it in version control and also share it with other people, use abstractions to reduce complexity, for example, just the simple thing to define variables and use them at multiple places and also reduce the statefulness of the system so you don't make tiny changes everywhere and then you don't remember how the thing uh, worked or what you've already changed in your system. And someone recommended to me that I should look into Nix. And um, to understand Nix, so this took me a while to understand, but this is an ecosystem of multiple things. Uh, first, there's Nix, a functional package manager. And what functional means is that all dependencies are referred to by hashes. So if a dependency changes, the package is rebuilt. And this cannot, um, this cannot result in other packages being broken because they use different dependencies. So you can have multiple uh, versions of a dependencies on the same system. Um, and it also allow because Nix always knows which dependencies you're using, you can easily do rollbacks if something goes wrong. Then there's Nix OS. So this is running on the Nix Bitcoin target. This is a Linux distribution with a declarative approach to configuration management built on top of Nix. So what does declarative approach mean? We've already seen that. So this is a configuration.nix. Uh, and this has nothing to do with Nix Bitcoin. You can do that on any Nix OS machine. Uh, we've seen the header before, and now we're also saying Bitcoin D enable true. We set a port that we want to use for Bitcoin D, and then we say we want a hidden service on that port for Bitcoin D. We run NixOS rebuild switch. 
and then our system will reflect that. So we have Bitcoin D running with a hidden service. Then there's the Nix packages. This is the collection of Nix packages and Nix OS modules. Mostly they are just descriptions for how to build these packages, also text files. They look very similar to the modules we've already seen. So this is a very transparent, just a GitHub repository. And then there's NixOps, which is a declarative tool for deploying sets of NixOS Linux machines. We've seen that before. This is how we deploy uh, Nix Bitcoin. So what you do there is you have a network file where you say, okay, I have, in this case, Bitcoin node. This is my only machine. And the target is a virtual box, memory size, CPUs, etc. Then you run create. NixOps create to create this net network and then you can run NixOps deploy to deploy your configuration on the network. Okay, so using Nix helps because you can do deployments and updates with a single command. You have reproducible for ease of use and security. It uses standard Linux tools like systemd services under the hood and it uses a simple functional type language. And um, just to show you the advantage of this, so this was the uh, configuration.nix we've seen earlier. Now, the Bitcoin D port is defined as being either null or a integer. And what happens if we did, would not specify this, so this actually happened to me. This doesn't move. Oh, now it works. So Nix would immediately notice that this doesn't work if we don't specify it because the Tor hidden service requires an integer, but in this case it's null. So Nix says this cannot work and so we notice problems uh, very early on without having to go to log files or something like that. So what do you need to do in order to customize Nix Bitcoin? The easiest thing is go, to the con go through the configuration.nix and there are a lot of configuration options there. They are all documented. Mostly you just need to uncomment them. And um, there are more options in the uh, modules directory. Just, you can just uh, look into that. So for example, you can set pruning. If you want to and know what you're doing, if you also enable C-Lightning and you can set a different DB cache, you can set a different address where C-Lightning is listening and so on. If an option that you need is not available, feel free to open an issue in the Nix Bitcoin GitHub repo. So we might do that for you or you can define it yourself. Um, since I have a little bit of time left, I just want to give you a taste of how a module would look like. So this is a part of the C-Lightning module, which, is, which I um, separated into three sections. So let's look at the middle section first, where you say, where you specify all the options that C-Lightning has. So here we have an option for auto-listen, which is a, it may, basically means listen, if the service should listen. So there's a description here. You say it's type boolean and um, by default it's false. And in the top you say how the configuration file is actually written because uh, C Lightning reads a configuration file, right? So what you're doing is you just write a string auto lesson equal to either the string true or the string false depending on what cfg.autolesson says. And then at the bottom, we define the systemd service. So if this module is enabled, then we define the service. We say this uh, goes after the Bitcoin D service and we say how it started. Exactly, we give it a lightning directory. So these uh, things um, here in the braces, these are basically Nix variables and you run it with a user C Lightning. Okay, in conclusion, the whole Nix Bitcoin system is relatively flexible. You can use it as a personal wallet, as I do, or as a platform for Bitcoin, because you can also build stuff on top of it. For example, the recurring donations module and other layer two protocols uh, that we want to see. For example, we are interested in 
adding C Lightning plugins, we don't have any right now. Also, more on chain uh, privacy with automatic coin joins and so on and so forth, watchtowers, whatever, custodial wallets for your friends and family. Uh, so, um, please develop more software <laughs> because that is what we want to add to Nix Bitcoin. And if you want to try it out, just go to our GitHub repo, follow the tutorial. I'm here to help. You can try it out on VirtualBox and let's open some channels. Thank you. I think we have a little bit of time for questions, if there are any. No. Yeah, maybe a dumb question as a mathematician. Why using Nix and not Docker, for example? To uh, because Docker solves. Uh, repeat the question. Ah, yeah. Why use Nix and not Docker? Docker solves a different problem. Docker containerizes your service. And we do that as well, but not with Docker. We use namespaces, Linux namespaces and C groups. So we do that a little bit more manually. What so Nix are many different things, but I view mix, Nix more like an Ansible replacement, if you know that. It's more like a, I use it as more like a DevOps tool that tells you how to structure your system. You can also write a Docker Compose file, but I think it's much less powerful than Nix because it's just a flat file without, it's not a programming language for one. And, um, you still don't know how your image is built. I mean, it doesn't have all the nice dependency features that Nix does. But you can use Docker in Nix, and we do that for some things. Yeah. So you uh, said about the reproducible builds. So uh, it's uh, reproducible here is a, as in uh, uh, versions or yeah, I sh uh, so. Binary. Yeah, he's asking what reproducible means. Does that mean binary or just versions? And it's the latter. It just means versions. I think it's the wrong term. It, it, I should change it. Is it possible to uh, get a binary reproducible build? Yes, of course. Actually, I found a website where they say it would work that 98% is already reproducible in, in Nix, but not everything. But I guess it's the whole ecosystem is also uh, working towards that direction because, of course, everyone wants reproducible builds. Uh, just, just nobody uh, made this this yet. Not yeah, exactly, because they need, I mean, software needs to be changed and maybe not everyone is as interested as we are in these things. But I, I shouldn't say reproducible here because reproducible in the Bitcoin world means something different than in the Nix world. Okay, no questions. Ah. Is there any overlap with Jameson Lopp's Bitcoin Core config generator? Are there specific configs that you would recommend for security purposes? Um, so the def I would recommend the, defol the defaults that we already have there. <laughs> so. I mean, for security purposes, it depends what you mean by security. I mean, everything should be secure in Bitcoin Core, otherwise it would be really bad. But there are some options that are turned on by default that might introduce a denial of service vector, for example, bloom filters and so on, and we've turned these things off. You have this. Yeah, yeah, because it's not really needed for us, and the danger is just too high, I think. Okay. Cool, then thanks again. Come to me if you want to learn how this works. Yeah.